Hi, welcome back to our channel. Please like and subscribe for more classic TV and music content and please follow us on Twitter, Instagram and all our socials to interact with us. All links will be in the description below. Thanks and enjoy the video. The Americans have finally evacuated Saigon in a big helicopter operation. There are said to be moves afoot for a ceasefire and it seems that the communists have all but won the long Vietnamese war. At home, a gloomy report from the Price Commission. More exchanges in the row about whether Labour Party funds should be used for the anti-market campaign. 200 women take part in an experiment to reduce menstruation. And at Bow Street, moves for the extradition of Mr Stonehouse and his former secretary. The war in Vietnam seems about to end with the communists winning after 30 years of fighting. Reports from Saigon tonight said that the communists and the South Vietnamese had agreed in principle to a ceasefire on terms that amount to surrender by... ...on and Murphy guilty. Can the Court of Appeal truly be said to have fully discharged its obligation under law to re-examine the case as the Home Secretary requested? Perhaps most important of all, has justice been seen to be done, not in the eyes of lawyers, but by the canons of common sense? Finally, our concern tonight has been only with whether the processes of law have taken a proper course. It's not been our aim to argue that two innocent men are in jail. That was a matter for the jury, the Court of Appeal, and the Home Secretary. But it is perhaps important to remember that Cooper and McMahon have another 15 years to serve for the murder of Reginald Stevens on September the 10th, 1969. Good night. Starting on BBC Two in just over a minute, the goodies. The news now on BBC One, and at 9.25, Kojak finds himself in a tricky situation in tonight's story, Trade-Off. This is the nine o'clock news. Good evening. British Steel's chief confirms there'll have to be up to 20,000 redundancies in the industry, but the steel unions are fighting them. The biggest railway union threatens a revolt by its members unless they get a 30% rise. The pound falls to another record low. The Foreign Office is urgently considering whether some South Vietnamese refugees should come to Britain. And we look at two revivals, a newspaper plant and a railway station. The British Steel Corporation plan to cut their labour force by up to 20,000 between now and next spring. They say they're losing two and a half million pounds a week and demand for steel is falling every day. The proposals would involve closing several plants during the recession. From the unions there's been a flat no. It was the union side in fact which gave the news of the planned redundancies after they had had talks with British Steel. They have made proposals that include numbers uh, large numbers uh, as far as identities are concerned. We have rejected these proposals and it is intended that we should meet our executives and we will also have a uh, further meeting with the corporation on May the 19th. We think that the British Steel will alter their proposals. That's our firm conviction because we intend to put forward alternative constructive proposals. Which will avoid mass layoffs which, in our view, should avoid mass redundancies. The Steel Corporation spelt out the number of redundancies as between 16,500 and 20,000, including management staff. Some plants would close down until the demand for steel picked up again in Lanarkshire, Shelton and Ebervale. Some other plants would have to cut back in production. But more up-to-date and low-cost plants at Scunthorpe, Ravenscraig, Clanwern and Port Talbot would take on a bit of extra work. To all this, the union said no, and also no to the alternative proposal 
that the agreement on the guaranteed week might be suspended, thereby allowing the corporation to lay off workers. The union's alternative proposal is likely to be some form of work sharing, which won't meet the steel corporation's problems, which are very considerable. A deficit this year of perhaps 200 million pounds or more, rapidly rising costs, a severe recession in the demand for steel, and they say a labor force that's too large. Larry Harris asked British Steel's chief executive, Mr. Bob Scully, if in the end, sacking's were inevitable. We believe so. We believe that no matter how much we try to soften it, we've got to look at our manpower, which is too high in our view. Do you expect any opposition to this from the government itself? Well, it's difficult to say. <clears throat> of course, what we want uh, in the difficulties we have at the moment is help from government. Uh, we've just got to wait and see what stance the government's going to take in all this, I think. A battle ahead for the Steel Corporation or not? Well, uh, life's been one big battle thus far. Uh, one hopes that one day it will end. Uh, maybe uh, not, not on this particular issue. Well, there does seem to be a battle at personal level between Sir Monty Finneson, the Steel Corporation chairman, and Mr Anthony Wedgwood Ben, the industry secretary. Ruffled by reports last week of 20,000 redundancies in the steel industry, Mr. Wedgwood Ben asked, in writing, for answers to certain questions about the corporation's plans for running down manpower. Sir Monty replied to him today, at some length. In advance of the talks with the unions, he didn't spell out the figures. But he said that British Steel was doing its bit towards regenerating British industry, a phrase often used by Mr. Ben himself. But at present, much of its equipment was obsolescent or obsolete, and it was taking many more people to produce steel at a higher cost than in other advanced industrial countries. Steel jobs in Wales would be very severely cut back if the corporation's plans were allowed to go ahead. Our industrial correspondent in Cardiff, Patrick Hannan, outlines the position facing Welsh steelmen. Wales will be by far the hardest hit part of the country if the Steel Corporation's axe does fall. Eight or nine thousand of the 60,000 Welsh steel workers will be losing their jobs. And under the corporation's long-term planning, many of them may never be taken back. The idea is to concentrate production at the big works like Port Talbot and San Wern, where the most effective use can be made of manpower and resources. Which means that other plants, some of them in areas of high unemployment, will face the most severe problems. At Ebu Vale, the corporation is planning to end iron and steel making and to close indefinitely other parts of the plant. Thousands of jobs already at risk under the corporation's closure program could well be lost during the next few months instead of over the next two years. And at the moment, there are few other jobs available for the men to go to in Ebu Vale. But with the Steel Corporation currently losing something like a million pounds a week in Wales alone, it's clearly got to do something to tackle the problem. The only hope for many men at Ebervale now is that the steel unions can persuade the corporation to do it another way. The Tribunal on Railwomen's Pay has been told by the biggest rail union, the NUR, that its members could revolt unless they get substantially more than the 21.2% increase British Rail has offered. The Tribunal, which is being chaired by Dr William McCarthy, today heard all three rail unions putting their case for rises of at least 30%. Earlier, British Rail's Industrial Relations Officer, Mr. Bert Farrand, said the board couldn't possibly afford to increase its offer. Mr. Farrand said the railways were in an extremely grave financial position. He claimed the offer compensated for the rise in the cost of living over the past year, and he said the social contract guidelines were still relevant. But Mr. Sidney Wheel of the NUR said the board's inability to pay wasn't a valid reason for denying railwaymen adequate wages. They wanted increases comparable to those awarded to the miners, postmen and power workers. The tribunal was adjourned until Friday when it's expected that an award will be announced. Pay talks between leaders of nearly half a million teachers and their employers ended in deadlock and the issue is to go to arbitration. The teachers want a 26% rise, the same as civil servants were recently awarded. They say the employer's offer is worth about 15%. The employers say it's over 21% in line with the cost of living increase. It's been a bad day in the city again. After a sharp fall in share prices, the Financial Times Index closed this afternoon 15.7 down on Friday's figure, and the pound fell two-tenths of a point to a record low against major foreign currencies, 23.3% below the 1971 figure. Here's our economics correspondent, Dominic Harrod.
It's more bad news for anyone buying anything foreign, from a summer holiday to a car, a transistor radio, a piece of furniture or even food. That's the message of today's drop in the international purchasing power of the pound. Compared to the expert's yardstick of international value, the poor old pound has now floated down more than 23 and a quarter percent in the last three years. And of that, the last tuppence has come in the last three weeks, a sudden acceleration. And the recent dive in the pound's value followed newspaper reports that the government wanted it to happen, to help exports. Denials last week by the government didn't stop the slide, though I'm told by dealers today that the pressure of selling by foreigners, which is what pushes the pound down, was far less than at the end of last week. And it's also been an uncomfortable day on the stock exchange, with a big fall in the Financial Times Index, measuring industrial share values. There was bad news of investment prospects and a suggestion that city funds should, despite denials by government last week, be directed into industry. These two stories were enough to send shares down by 15 points this morning. Despite a lunchtime rally, the share index ended at its lowest, the lugubrious measure of investors' confidence standing at just 315, the biggest daily fall in share prices for quite a while. The Foreign Office said today it was urgently considering proposals to allow some South Vietnamese refugees to settle in Britain. Although no decision has yet been taken, the Home Secretary, Mr Jenkins, and the Foreign Office officials are studying the question. In Washington, meanwhile, President Ford has asked Congress for more than $500 million to transport and care for refugees in the United States. Some 27,000 refugees have already arrived in the Pacific island of Guam on their way to the United States. Among them are three brigadier generals who headed police operations in Saigon. Because of their activities, they're being hurried through the processing formalities. One, calling himself Trung Bai, was identified as General Hin Tai Te, chief of the special police branch investigating Viet Cong. With him was a man who said he was an infantry colonel and was recognized as Tran Van Zhao, head of the Saigon police branch responsible for surveillance of politicians. The third man turned out to be Tran Si Tang, Saigon's police chief. Having escaped from the communists, all three men fear retribution from other refugees. There's been special resentment among many of the refugees at the special treatment, according to high-ranking officers. But one group of aircraft mechanics are asking for a rather different form of special treatment. Forty-five of them want to return to Vietnam. They say they were misled when their pilots flew them to Thailand. They believe they were simply going to another base in Vietnam, and they've written to President Ford to ask him to help them to get back. One man's own effort to evacuate his Vietnamese in-laws from Saigon has ended in success. When American Dick Swanson found his attempts to have his wife's family flown out blocked by red tape, he flew out to Saigon himself to get them out, just days before the city fell to the communists. John Humphreys reports. Dick Swanson's house is a little overcrowded these days, but no one's complaining. Mr. Swanson, in fact, has become something of a local celebrity for having succeeded in pulling off a mini-evacuation all of his own, single-handed. With the collapse of Saigon just a couple of days away, Mr. Swanson left Washington by air to try and round up all 12 relatives of his Vietnamese-born wife and bring them back to the United States, a seemingly impossible task. But he did it. And today, while many of their countrymen are still in Saigon or waiting despondently in transit camps in the Pacific or in military barracks in the United States, they are all here, reunited as a family. Mr. Swanson still finds it hard to believe that what he'd failed to achieve in months of negotiating through the proper channels, he managed to pull off in the final chaotic hours of South Vietnam using highly irregular methods. Well, one Thursday afternoon, uh, I decided that... Uh Nobody else was going to get them out, so I, I took off for Saigon. And I arrived on a Saturday, uh, got the family together, made our plan, and uh, Sunday morning we got our commandeered truck and loaded up and went on the base. And uh, I circumvented the, the bureaucracy and paperwork, and uh, by 4 o'clock that afternoon we were on a plane to Guam. And we arrived in Guam at uh, 4 in the morning, and by 4 that afternoon we were on our way to Honolulu and El Toro in California. You make it all sound fairly easy, really, was it? Uh, well, in looking back, I don't wish to do it again. There are still problems ahead. They can't all live here indefinitely, and they've little money, no jobs, and nothing planned. But at least they're together, and they're safe. 
The State Department in Washington said tonight it had learned that the new Khmer Rouge government in Cambodia had killed some 80 people identified with the regime that fell three weeks ago. Among them were the wives of some of the leaders. According to the State Department, other types of reprisals are also being carried out. The 33 countries attending the Commonwealth Conference in Jamaica have reached agreement on enforcing stricter sanctions against Rhodesia. Our diplomatic correspondent, who's in Kingston, says the communique to be issued tomorrow at the end of the conference will contain a commitment to compensate Mozambique financially if it agrees to cut Rhodesia's rail links with the Indian Ocean. The railway line from Salisbury to Barra has acted as an economic lifeline to Rhodesia for the past nine years. But it's expected that the African government, which takes over full power in Mozambique next month, will agree to cut it. From Machipanda, Clive Small reports. Every day, four freight trains leave Machipanda here in Mozambique and roll across the border into Rhodesia, just up the line. They carry vital supplies up from the coast at Baira, the supplies that have helped to keep the Smith regime's economy going for the last nine years. A Rhodesia Railways diesel engine that's come across the border from Umtali moves in to pick up another load of supplies for the Smith regime. 85% of Rhodesia's foreign imports come in on this line and the one from Lorenzo Marx to the south. The African nationalists believe that if the Commonwealth or the United Nations can help to stop this rail traffic, Mr Ian Smith will have little bargaining power at the conference table. This traffic is worth 200 million pounds to the ordinary people of Mozambique and their new Frelimo government. So those who want to stop this rail traffic getting across the border will have to compensate Mozambique for the loss it'll mean. And meanwhile, another goods train pulls across the border with another transfusion for Rhodesia's embattled economy. The common market. And in a parliamentary written answer today on the community budget, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Mr Joel Barnett, said that Britain received £35 million more than she contributed in the financial year just ended. Our economics correspondent says that this gain from the community budget compares with an expected loss of £35 million in the government's most recent estimates. In speeches outside Parliament, Mr Anthony wedgwood Benn's accusation that the BBC is biased in its handling of the common market referendum campaign has brought replies from pro-marketeers on both Labour and Conservative sides. A Cabinet Economics Minister, Mr Harold Lever, told a Manchester meeting that Labour Party colleagues had clamoured for a referendum as a device for sabotaging entry to Europe. He said that screaming about bias by the media was making advance excuses for impending defeat. Mr Edward Heath, the former Conservative leader speaking in Birmingham, described Mr Benn's attitude to the BBC as the last resort of a politician in trouble. British egg producers clashed with docks police in Southampton tonight when the farmers again tried to prevent imports of cheap French eggs from entering the country. The farmers, who claimed that cheap eggs could put British producers out of business, burst through a police cordon to blockade the ferry terminal. From Southampton, Mike Purton reports. A convoy of more than two dozen cars was stopped at the dock gate. Come on! There were angry exchanges with two policemen who tried to prevent them entering. But after some scuffles, the egg producers decided to run the gauntlet of the policemen. They parked their cars across the entrance to the ferry terminal. The idea was to prevent a consignment of eggs being landed from the ferry Leopard. But the boat didn't arrive. She'd been kept overnight in La Havre, officially for maintenance purposes. As a police sergeant took the numbers of the cars, the demonstrators were told that they'd be reported for trespass, while Major Barry Webster, their leader, said he was considering bringing a charge of assault against the police. The Social Services Secretary, Mrs Barbara Castle, announced in the Commons tonight interim plans until health service pay beds can be phased out by law. She is to get rid of 500 private beds in areas where they're underused, and hospital doctors will be asked to have a single waiting list for both public and private patients. Private patients are estimated to contribute about £30 million a year to the health service. And although Mrs Castle admits there'll be a loss of revenue, the government is to set aside £5 million to help produce waiting lists. 
all 300,000 copies of Scotland's new paper, the Daily News, were said to have been snapped up before breakfast when the first issue went on sale this morning. The 500 workers who've taken over the plant at the old Scottish Daily Express offices in Glasgow were jubilant. But it's estimated that the paper will have to go on selling more than two-thirds of those 300,000 copies permanently if it's to survive. Alistair Smith reports. There's no doubt that curiosity played a big part in this first edition sellout. And even in Albion Street, no one expects these mammoth figures to continue for long. They're gritting their teeth and preparing to fight for their very existence. For with three other Glasgow-based Scottish morning newspapers vying for advertising revenue and for readership, there can be little doubt that the battle will be a hard-fought one. Already we're getting orders well in advance of the current dates and great prospects to be included in the schedules in the forthcoming months. There is a feel for our type of paper in Scotland and a need for it. We find that the advertisers want our type of paper. We find that the type of people we'll be reaching are the type of audience that they wish to participate in. Last night they launched the Scottish Daily News in Champagne. But there's a lot of hard work to be done before the corks are popping again. The trial began in Glasgow today of seven men who were accused of conspiring to further the aims of a secret Scottish army. It's thought it could last six weeks. The men are said to have wanted to gain separation from England by violence and sabotage, and it's alleged they plan to break into defence establishments, disrupt power supplies, and blow up government buildings, and that they robbed a bank to finance their operations. David Scott was in court. Evidence was given by police who claimed they'd found various documents in the home of one of the accused, which included a map in which strategic pipelines and electricity cables were marked, and a book with notes on how to make explosives and time bombs. They also said they found a letter addressed to soldiers which urged them to stand aside while the people of Scotland struck at those in London who, the document said, had been ruling us for too long. The letter went on, we have no alternative but to resort to physical force. Through time you will be contacted on an individual basis. It's claimed the documents, including army manuals, were found in the home of Alistair Smith, a serving member of the Royal Highland Fusiliers until January of this year. It said the soldiers had fought in Belfast and asked them to be prepared to do the same in Glasgow, Birmingham, Dundee and other industrial cities. Also in the notebooks were remarks on revolutionary operations. Sewerage charges on the rates are illegal if they're for premises not connected to public sewers. This ruling by a High Court judge today came in a test case affecting 900,000 ratepayers in England and Wales and involving charges of £18 million which could be returned. Mr Justice Phillips said the charges were inconsistent with those allowed under the Water Act. In his judgment, charges under the Act were limited to people for whom services were performed and facilities provided. The first of the new high-speed trains has gone into passenger service with British Rail on the line from Bristol to London. For the moment it's travelling no faster than ordinary trains, but it gives passengers a glimpse of the future. Paul Reynolds went to take a look. British Rail's new express is wooing passengers with high-speed technology outside and in. Automatic doors became immediately popular today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the prototype high-speed train. There's air conditioning, double glazing, and even second class gets wall-to-wall -wall carpets. And in the bar they serve draft beer, the only train in Britain that does. Rail officials are hoping this train will win the passengers. Well, the first benefit, of course, is the benefit of speed, and uh, we shall be uh, reducing the journey time to Bristol by about 20 minutes, and the journey time to uh, Cardiff by about 30 minutes. But the new shape won't be common on the rail network until faster timetables next year. For now, drivers have to hold back speeds to 100 miles an hour, even though the train holds the world diesel record. But today, passengers and enthusiasts seem satisfied. How's the train doing, then? Very well. It's uh, braked a little bit early for Didcot. I suppose it got a bit checked, you know, actually arriving into the station. Uh, you know, it's on time. Left a bit late from Reading, but got away very nice and quickly, like, you know. Generally, you're quite impressed, though. Oh, yes, yes. Very nice indeed. Yeah. Over on Eastern Region, they were casting glances to the past rather than the future. British Rail reopened a tiny Norfolk station first built in the days of Queen Victoria and closed under the more cost-conscious reign of Dr Beechy. The first train for seven years pulled into Magdalen Road Halt today 
much to the delight of villagers who'd worked hard to reclaim their station. British Rail ran a special train to mark the event to the greeting of a 25-strong Silver Prize band. There was a carnival atmosphere among crowds of villagers, including 60 local school children who turned out for the occasion. Villagers raised most of the money for the station reopening. They provided more than 500 pounds for new platform lights by holding bingo sessions, dancers and tombolas. Others painted the waiting rooms and cleared a jungle of weeds from the platforms. Mr. Clark, why has it been necessary for the villagers to find some of the money for this station reopening? Well, under the Local Government Act, it should be the County Council responsible, but clearly under these days they can't find all of it, so it's been a tripartite action between British Rail, the County Council and the villagers, and I think it's desirable that the community should be shown to participate in what, after all, is for the general common good of the village. British Rail do have a reputation for closing stations. How do you feel about this reopening? Oh, I'm delighted. I'm just saying, I feel like a Victorian. I really feel I should be having a banquet in the waiting room. It's not often you get the opportunity to open a station these days. With due ceremony, the chairman of Norfolk County Council declared the station open to the chairs of villagers. cricket and uh, in today's Benson and Hedges cup matches Lancashire beat Nottinghamshire, Middlesex beat Sussex and Yorkshire beat Derbyshire and tonight's football results in Division 3 Bournemouth 2 Peterborough 1 this means Bournemouth go down to the fourth division in the Welsh Cup final first leg Wrexham 2 Cardiff 1 and now the main points of the news again the British Steel Corporation has confirmed there'll have to be up to 20,000 redundancies in the industry over the next 10 months. The pound has fallen to another record low against major foreign currencies, and the Foreign Office is still considering whether some Vietnamese refugees should come to Britain. News Extra tonight is at 20 past 10 on BBC Two. From Richard Whitmore and me, good night. Now the weather. Temperatures will be similar to today's, ranging from only 11 centigrade, 52 Fahrenheit on east coasts exposed to the northeast winds, to 16 centigrade, 61 Fahrenheit in some sheltered parts of northwest England. <laughs>